Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a briefing on the newly released report, Families Caring for an Aging America. I'm Jill Eden, Senior Program Officer in the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The three academies work together to provide independent, objective analysis and advice to the nation to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions. The academies operate under a congressional charter that was signed by President Lincoln in 1863. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me three members of the committee to discuss the report's findings and recommendations. Before I introduce the committee, I want to go over a few technical reminders. After these opening remarks, we will begin to take your questions through the Q&A box located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click Submit. Remember to identify yourself and your organization when you submit a question. If you have any technical issues during the event, please contact, contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Once again, the number for WebEx technical support is 1-866-229-3239. Now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee who are here with us today. Dr. Jennifer Wolf from the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins will discuss the background and context for the report and the committee's policy recommendations. Dr. Latson Hinton from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the UC Davis Health System will review the shifting demographics, increasing numbers of adults needing care, and the greater diversity of caregivers. And Dr. Karen Schumacher from the College of Nursing at the University of Nebraska Medical Center will talk about family caregivers' roles and experiences and how caregiving affects individuals' mental and physical health. We'll start off with their presentations and then open it up to questions. Please note that this briefing is scheduled to last one hour. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. I want to thank all of you who've called in to participate in the public briefing for the release of the report, Families Caring for an Aging America. I had the privilege of serving as a member of the committee that was responsible for writing the report, and it has truly been an honor to contribute to thinking about how to meaningfully address this important topic which affects individuals and families all over this country. Today, uh, we will summarize ma major findings and recommendations of the report, leaving time at the end to respond to questions from briefing participants. The first thing I want to do before we go through the rest of the presentation is to acknowledge the sponsors of the study whose funding was foundational to making this report possible and whose names are listed on the slide. I also would like to acknowledge that the report and the information that's being conveyed in this briefing is a representation of the work of a committee. The names of the committee members are listed here on this slide. Committee members were physicians, nurses, social workers, lawyers, and social scientists with uh, expertise um, and knowledge and insight, they were selected for their ability to contribute to thinking about this topic of family caregiving for older adults. The broader context underlying the report and the work of the committee is population aging, which has brought into sharp focus the public policy significance for family, of family caregiving and its implications for the financing and delivery of health care and long-term services and supports social security, state and local governments, employers, and consequences for individuals and families. Although family caregiving is an intensely personal issue at an individual level, there is a large body of empirical evidence which finds that family caregivers provide the majority of help to older adults who require help for health and functioning. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that the economic value of family caregiving exceeded $230 billion in 2011, 
and represented 80% of overall long-term services and supports delivery for older adults. It was the work of the committee to examine what is known about the adequacy of supportive programs and policies that address the needs of family caregivers of older adults. As those of you who are familiar with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine may know, our committee was given a scope of task, a set of charges that delineated our work. We thought about our scope of task very carefully and worked very hard to respond to each of the tasks that we were given in critically considering the nature and quality of available evidence to guide our recommendations. In some cases, there were topics that we did not review and discuss because they were outside our scope. In some cases, we were limited in our ability to make recommendations because of gaps in available evidence. Some of the topics that we did not review are important and could become the subject of future work. We had three main objectives. The first was to assess the prevalence and nature of family caregiving to older adults. The second was to assess the impact of caregiving on caregivers, their health, economic security, and well-being. And finally, we sought to recommend policies to address caregivers' needs and minimize the bar barriers they encounter as a result of caregiving. It is important to note that the work of our committee was focused on family caregivers of older adults as opposed to family caregiving across the lifespan, although some of our recommendations could apply to other populations. I wanted to briefly mention the process that we employed in drafting the report, which uh, was developed over a nearly two-year period. The process involved six committee meetings, numerous conference calls, one commission paper, an extensive review of the literature, two public forums that were held on both the East and West Coast where people had the opportunity to voice their perspectives, including the lived experiences of family caregivers themselves. There were 19 committee members, and this is a consensus report. This means that all 19 members had to agree with what is in the report. In some cases, committee members had differing perspectives, and we had many spirited discussions, but in the end, we came to a consensus that what is included in the report represents appropriate findings and recommendations that could advance the cause of honoring and supporting family caregivers while improving care quality and being aware of the implications of our recommendations for cost. With that said, I am now going to turn over the slide control and microphone to my colleague, Gladson Hinton, who will take you through some of the findings from the report. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, hello, everyone. Um, th on this next slide, um, I think we see highlighted the historic uh, demographic changes that um, this country is undergoing. In 2012, there were 43.1 million adults aged 65 and above. By 2030, um, that number will swell to 72.7 million. It's significant that the fastest growing cohort of older adults are those aged 80 and, 80 and above, uh, the group that's most likely to have physical or cognitive impairments and thus to need help from family caregivers. For example, more than half of those aged 85 and above need uh, family caregiving due to health and functioning. At the same time that the demand for family caregivers is increasing, the size of American families is shrinking. This is due to a number of factors, including lower fertility rates, higher rates of childlessness, increased divorce rates, all of which lead to smaller family size uh, and reduced availability of family caregivers, particularly uh, spouses and children. Next. This slide identifies the subgroup of caregivers who provide the most intense and demanding care. The report estimated that 8.5 million caregivers provide help to 4.9 million high-need older adults. Here, high-need is, is defined as assistance with two or more activities or a diagnosis of dementia. This subgroup of caregivers uh, significantly is at higher risk for adverse psychological, health, and economic consequences of caregiving. What we can see is that among those 4.9 million high-need older adults, 3.5 million, or nearly two-thirds, uh, have a diagnosis of dementia. This highlights the huge impact of dementia on caregiving, family caregiving needs. These data were drawn from the National Health and Aging Trends Study and are based on Medicare benefici beneficiaries aged 65 and above who are not institutionalized. Next slide. Another really important and historic demographic trend 
is the increasing racial and ethnic diversity of our older adult population. While the white non-Hispanic population of older adults will increase by about 50 percent between 2010 and 2040, um, as you can see from this uh, chart, the population of older adults who are African American, Hispanic, Asian, and of other races will increase by, by 300 percent. The older adult population is also diverse in other ways, with growing numbers of older adults uh, and who identify as LGBT, who reside in rural areas, who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. This increasing diversity of the older adult population and, and the family caregivers they rely on will shape the values, preferences, meanings, and resources that families bring to the family caregiving situation. This diversity highlights the need for a professional workforce uh, that, that is culturally and linguistically competent in working with older adults and their families. Next slide. One of the really important uh, themes throughout this report uh, and, uh, is the diversity and heterogene heterogeneity among care family caregivers. Um, older adults' need for caregiving is variable and can be episodic, daily, short, or long-term. And so caregiving itself can vary greatly in terms of all of these different uh, characteristics. Some people need short-term help after a hospital stay or a catastro non-catastrophic injury. Uh, some older adults, it's important to note, will never need a family caregiver's help. This report estimates that 17.7 million, million individuals are family caregivers who assist someone age 65 and above with physical, mental, or cognitive limitations that lead to some significant uh, impairments in functioning. Next slide. The theme of uh, heterogeneity is uh, really highlighted in this next uh, slide, uh, which, which uh, looks at the duration or the number of years caregivers of older adults spend caregiving. And what we can see is that um, of, the care, of, of family caregivers, 15% uh, provided caregiving for a year or less, 35% two to four years, 35% five to 10 years, and 15% were caregivers, reported being caregivers for more than 10 years. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, Karen. Thank you, Ladson, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll be summarizing key findings reported by the committee in chapters three through six of our report. So let's first consider the complexity of the family caregiving role and how it has changed in recent years. Family caregivers have always been the primary providers of older adults' long-term services and supports, such as assisting with household tasks and self-care, like getting in and out of bed, bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, and so forth. But today, Caregivers are also tasked with managing difficult medical procedures and equipment in older adults' homes. They also oversee medications, monitor symptoms and side effects, and navigate complex health and long-term services and support systems. These caregiving tasks include healthcare services, such as injections and IVs, that in the past were delivered only by licensed healthcare personnel. But family caregivers today also provide complex wound care, they manage drains and catheters of various kinds, and perform other technical procedures such as tracheostomy care. It's important to note that caregivers often do these complex tasks without the training, information, or supportive services they need. So the committee concluded that the family caregiving role is far more complex and demanding today than in the past, and caregivers need preparation for their role. Next slide. So how does caregiving impact the health of caregivers? The health impact of caregiving is highly individual and dependent on personal and family circumstances that vary greatly from one caregiver to another. So we are continuing the theme of variability among caregivers here. For some, caregiving instills confidence, provides meaning and purpose, enhances skills, 
and brings the caregiver closer to the older adult. But for others, caregiving leads to emotional distress, depression, anxiety, and impaired physical well-being. Both the intensity and duration of caregiving and the older adult's level of impairment are predictors of adverse consequences. Family caregivers who spend long, long hours caring for someone with advanced dementia are especially vulnerable. Other risk factors include low socioeconomic status, high levels of perceived suffering of the care recipient, living with the care recipient, lack of choice in taking on the caregiving role, poor physical health, lack of social support, and a physical home environment that makes care tasks difficult. In short, no two caregivers are alike. They have different needs and circumstances and respond to caregiving in different ways. These findings point to the need for assessment of individual caregivers, which will be discussed in a moment. Next slide. In addition to impacts on health, family caregiving poses substantial financial risks for some caregivers. These risks are described in detail in Chapter 4 of our report. Family caregivers of older adults with significant cognitive or physical impairments are at the greatest risk of financial harm. This is so especially for caregivers who are low income, have limited financial resources, reside with or live far from the care recipient, or have limited or no access to paid leave if they are employed. Caregivers may lose income, they may lose social security and other retirement benefits, and career opportunities if they have to cut back on work hours or leave the workforce. Caregivers may also incur substantial out-of-pocket expenses that can undermine their own future financial security. Next slide. Contributing to the financial risks experienced by family caregivers is our finding that many employed caregivers do not have unpaid or paid leave benefits at work. The lack of leave benefits affects large numbers of caregivers because more than half of family caregivers are employed either part-time or full-time. Daughters and sons-in-law, stepchildren, grandchildren, and siblings of older adults, however, are not eligible for the unpaid protections of the Family and Medical Leave Act, nor are employees of small terms of small firms eligible. Federal, state, and municipal laws provide some protections for employed family caregivers, but little is known about their impact on either caregivers of older adults or their employers. Next slide. Let's turn now to interventions to support family caregivers, which are described in Chapter 5. The committee found a robust body of research literature that documents the effectiveness of a wide array of interventions. This research literature has advanced to the point where we can now identify characteristics of the most effective interventions. The most effective interventions are those that are tailored to caregivers' risks, needs, and preferences. Remember the tremendous variability among caregivers that we have already described. No two are alike. Thus, it is clear that caregiver assessment is essential to effective interventions. Furthermore, research studies show that education and skills training can improve caregiver confidence and their ability to manage daily care challenges, and that counseling, self-care, relaxation training, and respite programs can improve both the caregiver's and care recipient's quality of life. In addition, some research suggests that personal counseling and care management may delay older adults' institutionalization and reduce rehospitalization. Unfortunately, numerous barriers limit caregivers' access to such services. While some effective research-based interventions are beginning to be provided to caregivers in real-world settings rather than in research studies, this is currently not the norm. 
Also, <clears throat> despite the extensive literature on interventions for family caregivers, important gaps in our knowledge remain. One critical gap is the paucity of intervention research with diverse populations. Thus, the committee concluded that additional research is needed to determine the effectiveness of interventions in diverse groups of caregivers. Next slide. What are the barriers that limit caregiver access to effective interventions? This question is addressed in Chapter 6. In short, the barriers are both wide-ranging and systemic, and they often prevent family caregivers from effectively engaging in the care of older adults. Family caregivers interact with a wide range of professionals, from physicians to home health aides, and they interact with numerous care organizations, such as home health agencies, hospitals, pharmacies, nursing homes, and others. Yet caregivers are often excluded from older adults' treatment decisions and care planning. They may be excluded even though care providers assume the caregiver is able and willing to perform essential tasks. Too often, care providers do not identify or assess the family caregiver and do not seek critical health information about the older adult from the caregiver. A host of other barriers to effective engagement with family caregivers exist. Examples include payment rules that discourage provider interactions with family caregivers, misinterpretation of HIPAA privacy rules, and lack of training to work effectively with family caregivers. In other words, family caregivers play an integral role in the care of older adults, but they are often marginalized or ignored in the delivery of both health care and long-term services and supports. Failure to engage family caregivers has significant consequences. It leaves them unprepared for the tasks they are expected to perform and imposes significant economic and personal burdens. So, in summary, taking into account the growing need for and diversity of family caregivers, the demands and complexities of the caregiving role, the potential for adverse health and economic impacts, the availability of effective research-based interventions, and the persistence of systemic barriers that prevent access to interventions and needed services, the committee concluded that family caregiving has become a critical issue of public policy. Therefore, the committee calls for a transformation in the policies and practices that affect family caregivers of older adults. Jennifer will now present the recommendations for action that the committee believes are needed to bring about this transformation. Jennifer? Thanks. The recommendations that I'll be discussing are covered in Chapter 7 of the report. Uh, the, we had four discrete recommendations, um, and as Karen mentioned, the report, um, these recommendations emanate from the findings of the committee, which raised um, significant concerns about the state of family caregiving of older adults in the U.S. To that end, the committee calls for the, net, the administration that will be taking office in 2017 to take steps that would address the health, economic, and social issues that face family caregivers of older Americans. The committee recommends that the Secretary of Health and Human Services, in collaboration with the Secretaries of Labor, Veterans Affairs, other federal agencies, and private sector organizations with expertise in family caregiving, develop and execute a national family caregiver strategy to explicitly and systematically recognize the essential role of family caregivers and move to better support them in care delivery. The recommendation calls for a broad transformation of care delivery, payment, and workforce training to move towards family-centered care. The recommendation calls for transparent implementation, convening of partnerships with appropriate government and private sector leaders, attending to the needs and preferences of culturally and ethnically diverse populations, and for producing biannual reports on progress and actions towards addressing identified goals of the strategy. 
Our first recommendation has seven interrelated subparts that address key elements of the national strategy. The first subpart, 1A, calls for the development, testing, and implementation of effective mechanisms that would facilitate the identification and support of family caregivers in the delivery of healthcare and long-term services and supports. This recommendation flows from the findings that Karen discussed from Chapter 5, that effective interventions begin with an assessment of caregivers' circumstances, including their strengths, challenges, and preferences, but that these interventions have typically been developed outside of care delivery and have um, often uh, not been typically diffused. Therefore, the tools, workflows, and data capture systems that would guide these processes to systematically um, diffuse effective interventions currently um, do not typically exist and will require formative work and evaluation. Recommendation 1B calls for CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to develop, test, and implement provider payment reforms that would motivate providers to engage family caregivers in delivery processes across all modes of payment and models of care. The committee noted the encouraging steps that have been undertaken that recognize the role of family caregivers in Medicare and Medicaid coverage, payment, and delivery, such as conditions of participation changes that move towards an expectation that family caregivers are engaged and supported in discharge planning. The committee also noted that innovative models such as accountable care organizations and other value-based payment methods implicitly encourage partnerships with family caregivers who are already present and involved in the care of persons with some of the most significant health needs. However, thus far, explicit attention has not been devoted to understanding the effects of these payment changes uh, for family caregivers. Changes thus far create a potential for, rather than a commitment to, developing effective practices that support provider engagement and support of family caregivers, which is the focus of Recommendation 1B. Recommendation 1C calls for efforts to strengthen the capacity and training of healthcare and long-term services and supports providers to recognize and engage family caregivers and provide them with evidence-based supports and referrals to services in the community. The report notes efforts in this area by some professions and through some targeted initiatives, such as the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, but finds that work falls short of the systematic and comprehensive effort that is needed. The report calls for action to develop and enforce competencies for identifying and assessing and supporting family caregivers by providers of care, supported by regulatory and accrediting organizations, training programs, state agencies, and professional organizations that would incorporate competencies into standards for licensure and certification. The recommendation also calls for clarification by the Office of Civil Rights to provide administrative guidance regarding permitted use and disclosures of protected health information under the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act to improve appropriate information access for family caregivers. Recommendation 1D calls for increased funding for programs that would provide explicit support for family caregivers, including the National Family Caregiver Support Program, and for the development, dissemination, and implementation of evidence-based caregiver intervention programs. This recommendation draws from finding, our finding that the National Family Caregiver Support Program is currently the first and only widely available federal program that is devoted to addressing the needs of family caregivers of older adults. The program has been in existence for 15 years with flat funding of approximately $150 million despite growth in the prevalence and complexity of family caregiving. Drawing from findings in Chapter 5, the recommendation also calls for attention to the translation and dissemination of existing evidence-based programs, particularly those that are comprehensive, longitudinal, and tailored to attend to the diverse circumstances, needs, and preferences of family caregivers. Recommendation 1E calls for exploring, evaluating, and adopting federal policies that provide economic support for working caregivers. This recommendation draws directly on findings from Chapter 4 that caregiving is increasingly intertwined with employment, that about half of all family caregivers work, and that flexibility and supportive policies are pivotal in the ability to balance competing work and family demands. The report emphasizes progress towards paid family leave for federal employees by some states and by private employers, 
but the report also notes gaps and calls for additional study of the effects of policy changes to support working family caregivers, as well as others, including Social Security caregiving credits, including family caregiver status as a protected class under federal employment discrimination laws, and the development of best practice employer policies and training on how to support employees who care for an older family member. Recommendation 1F calls for an expansion of the data collection infrastructure within the Departments of Health and Human Services and Veterans Affairs to facilitate monitoring, tracking, and reporting on family caregiving. This rec recommendation calls for a multi-source data collection system that would enable more comprehensive and detailed understanding of family caregivers, including their numbers, who they are, what they do, how much they do, and the effects of family caregiving for a range of health, economic, and social outcomes for both individuals and society. The availability of data infrastructure is foundational to the success of a national strategy and the ability to monitor, monitor the changing composition and experiences of family caregivers, including the effects of our efforts to better support them. The committee notes the importance of varied types of data, including nationally representative survey data, as well as data that's collected in routine delivery of care that can only be obtained with the adoption of practices to identify, assess, and support family caregivers in delivery processes as outlined in 1A and discussed by uh, Karen. Recommendation 1G calls for launching a multi-agency research program to evaluate caregiver interventions in real-world health and community settings across diverse conditions and populations for a wide array of outcomes. This sub-recommendation focuses on cross-agency and cross-sector collaboration to coordinate research endeavors that would facilitate the translation and dissemination of best practices and evidence-based models into care delivery with attention to priority populations, the diversity of caregiving, and the potential use of emerging technologies. Recommendation two on the next slide Um, recommendation two builds on findings in the report that states are now innovating in Medicaid programs, managed care, and in legislative policies that affect family caregivers in important ways, such as through paid family leave, expansions, expansions of the Fa Family and Medical Leave Act eligibility criteria that Karen mentioned, and in policies that affect family caregivers' interactions within systems of care delivery, such as the Caregiver Advise, Record, and Enable Act, or the CARE Act, which calls for hospitals to identify and support family caregivers in the hospital discharge process. This recommendation calls for states to share best practices to facilitate learning and translation of policies that would support family caregivers. Recommendation three calls for the establishment of a public-private multi-stakeholder innovation fund for research and innovation that would accelerate the pace of change in addressing the needs of caregiving families. This recommendation recognizes that addressing the range of issues that caregivers confront will require and benefit from the involvement and guidance of the private sector, including employers, insurance firms, and technology innovators. This recommendation aims to leverage private funding and the involvement of nonprofit organizations and private foundations to complement public resources with the idea of sponsoring market-driven approaches that would alleviate caregiving challenges and target scalable and sustainable services and products such as assistive devices, remote monitoring, sensoring, um, sensor and telehealth systems, some of which might be linked to providers of healthcare or long-term services and support, or facilitate communication with community organizations such as area agencies on aging. And finally, recommendation four calls for explicit and sustained attention to the needs and values of diverse family caregivers, such that specific goals for each recommendation incorporate attention to diversity, that cultural competence is included in provider training and competencies, that research efforts and monitoring enable meaningful understanding and attention to strategies that address the diverse needs of family caregivers across dimensions of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and religiosity, among other relevant factors. And with that, I'll turn the mic back over to Jill. Thank you, 
Thank you, everyone. That was terrific. Um, now we can turn to your questions. Um, but before I do that, um, there's a lot of interest in downloading the slides, and so I want to remind everyone that you can download a copy of the report, the report brief, today's slides, and a recording of today's session at our uh, website, www.nationalacademies.org slash caregiving. So our first question uh, is from Sharon Rose. Why are these medical tasks not being performed by professionals in the medical field? And why are the caregivers not receiving medical training for these tasks? Karen, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, it's a great question. Uh, one of the um, primary um, trends that has been going on for some time now is that hospitalizations are shorter and home health benefits are increasingly constrained so that family caregivers' access to health professionals has changed over the last couple of decades, uh, whereas hospitalizations were quite a bit longer some 20, 25 years ago, and home health benefits were more uh, readily available. Uh, caregivers got more assistance from, from um, medical professionals during that period of time. But as increasingly uh, caregivers are, are performing these procedures at home without help, uh, one reason is another consideration, I guess I should say, is that a lot of these procedures have to be done repeatedly. So whereas a, a home health nurse may come out uh, once a week or even three times a week to, to help and demonstrate and teach uh, the family caregiver, the procedure itself may have to be done several times a day. That would, uh, one example might be wound care in, in, in that regard. Another trend is that um, medical procedures are becoming more complex themselves and more readily disseminated to outpatient and community settings. So at the same time hospitalizations are shorter, there's more medical technology to actually use in the home. So those are some of the reasons why um, caregivers are doing these tasks as opposed to um, healthcare professionals. But the second part of your, your question is, is why is the training not occurring? Um, that is, is also a very, very important consideration. There needs to be more um, consistent identification of who the caregivers are. For example, when an older adult is being discharged from a hospital and what the caregivers' capabilities are and their availability to provide care, we have a lot of work to do to um, improve consistent, sustained, uh, dependable, um, in-depth uh, assessment of what caregivers need. And that is uh, a major um, area of development for us in, as, a, as a nation in the future. Um, caregivers are uh, not always, but still too often, not recognized and identified by healthcare providers. And so their needs just, just um, go unaddressed. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, this is uh, Ladson. I just wanted to um, to add to to what Karen just said. I do think that um, this question speaks to something that's addressed in recommendation uh, one, which is the real need for strengthening the professional workforce uh, so that it's it's better um, equipped uh, and trained to be able to effectively engage and educate uh, caregivers about. Uh, some of these uh, these critical issues where they need support and and skills. So I think it really highlights uh, you know the workforce capacity uh, strengthening and and uh, and training recommendation. Uh, another question uh, asks: Is this the first time that the National Academy of Medicine has made recommendations regarding family caregiving to an administration? Um, uh, uh, this is Jill. <laughs> um, 
I actually am not sure. I know that other, other reports that we've done have addressed family caregiving in some way. For example, the Retooling for an Aging America report from about uh, the late 2009-2010. Um, but I believe this is the first time that um, we've ever assembled a committee to focus specifically on um, policy issues related to family caregiving of older adults. And I've got a question for Latson. Um, diversity is a common theme throughout this report. What could policymakers do to address it? Um, thank you, Jill. There are a number of, uh, I think, important uh, recommendations and findings in this report uh, with respect to diversity. And I just wanted to highlight um, some of the really, uh, I think, priority areas that are reflected uh, in the report. Um, first, I think that um, what one of our findings is, is that there really is a gap uh, in terms of the population level data that we have with respect to diverse populations. So in surveys, uh, even like the National Health and Aging Trends Survey, uh, that while that does capture some uh, aspects of diversity, that we clearly uh, need um, better data uh, from surveys like that about diverse uh, subgroups of caregivers in order to uh, really evaluate the impact of, of caregiving and to follow that over time. Um, similarly, I think our recommendation that um, we need better data in clinical settings uh, is really important with respect to diversity. And that's because uh, right now, because family caregivers often are not routinely identified in clinical settings, and this is not recorded in the medical record, we really don't have the ability to look within the, uh, for example, the healthcare system at, uh, at possible differences or disparities in the quality of care uh, that's delivered to older adults and their family caregivers um, with respect to um, uh, different racial and ethnic groups, uh, for example, or other aspects of diversity. Um, I think another really important, um, uh, you know, priority area for uh, diversity is around training uh, and strengthening the, uh, the professional workforce. And so we need not only a workforce that is uh, prepared and trained to work with families, but also to, to work with culturally diverse families. And so that, I think, is a really important uh, area for for, uh, for further work and progress. Um, you know, one other uh, point um, that I think was mentioned by Karen and Jennifer in their presentations was the need in uh, clinical settings for routine identification and assessment uh, of caregivers. And I think that assessment of caregivers, uh, the report um, emphasizes that that needs to take into account to elicit uh, the values, preferences, and needs of caregivers so that the support that we give to caregivers can be tailored. And of course, that's going to be very uh, helpful and very important in working with culturally diverse populations. Uh, finally, I would just uh, point back to the very first uh, recommendation um, in which uh, we recommend that there be a national family caregiver strategy. And as part of that, we recommend that progress be monitored over time uh, as part of that strategy and that particular attention be given to, uh, uh, to diverse populations uh, and the progress that we're making there. Hi, we have a question about uh, states um, and their expansion of uh, the FMLA benefits to family caregivers of siblings. Um, and I, actually, I could take that one. Uh, we do have uh, information on all of the states that have expanded eligibility uh, to siblings as well as other types of relatives like daughters and sons-in-law, uh, grandchildren, and so on. And you can find that information in Chapter 4. Um, here is a question about um, can you say more about recommendations regarding non-dementia caregiving and how change in caregiving over time may impact that? Karen? Um, sure. Although we highlighted uh, 
caregivers of of older adults with dementia as a particularly vulnerable population, a report um, did address other health conditions that the care recipient might have. And uh, we describe uh, trajectories of change over time in the, in the caregiving role in Chapter 3. Um, noting, again, uh, continuing the theme of variability, that uh, trajectories are very um, specific, not only to the older older um, adults' condition, but also to the caregiver's life and situation. And so it's a bit difficult to generalize how caregiving changes over time. But to the extent that we can generalize, we can say that there are um, some trajectories or change over time that are are, are long and and follow a, a fairly um, consistent course. For example, there may be um, kind of predictable and consistent declines in an older adult's functional ability over time. Other conditions have a more unpredictable and, and variable up and down sort of uh, change over time, which impacts uh, their, the, the older adult's needs and also what the caregiver um, has to do and has, very importantly, has to learn to do um, as, the, as the condition changes. In addition to dementia, we highlight stroke and cancer in Chapter 3, but note that there are, are other conditions as well that require caregiving that are, are not like, like uh, dementia. Here's a question, so, Jennifer. Um, okay. What are the next what are the next steps for this result for the results of this report to be implemented and funded? Wow, that's a great great question. Um, so, my the uh, my understanding is that there has been funding that has gone to the Gerontological Society of America to continue uh, the dissemination of findings from the report. Uh, the, I, I know that there have been, um, a, there will are being a number of uh, meetings are being planned to um, in continue the discussion with uh, important stakeholders uh, regarding next steps from the report. Um, my understanding is that often these reports are um, after they've been released that they, that that uh, ongoing discussions do continue and that there um, often are you know, reconvening to, uh, of in, uh, influential stakeholders to evaluate um, the effects of the report and uh, steps that have been taken to implement recommendations. Um, so uh, it, it probably is too preliminary to know exactly, you know, how, what, how the uh, uh, next steps will unfold, but there is um, definitely a lot of interest in continuing um, uh, the momentum that uh, will, uh, continuing the momentum to try to implement um, recommendations when possible, um, it, you know, in some cases perhaps on a smaller scale than the national strategy as, you know, we continue, as we see how the uh, events will unfold in the coming months. Another question. Does the committee believe that caregiving per se, especially complex long-term caregiving, is a real health risk factor? Lasson? Sure. <clears throat> They're actually summarized in um, Chapter 3. Um, we have, uh, there's a whole section of Chapter 3 that addresses uh, the, uh, the impacts of caregiving. And um, caregivers who do sort of the longer duration and higher intensity caregiving are at increased risk for adverse psychological health uh, and also economic uh, impacts. Um, to speak to specifically to the health impacts that caregivers who do more intense and longer term caregiving are more likely to report poor uh, self uh, 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 self reported health uh, they're also um, more likely to have uh, uh, less healthy sort of uh, health behaviors uh, there's also evidence uh, on a biological level that um, they may suffer from higher levels of stress hormones that may have uh, some adverse uh, effect. Uh, 
So there clear, there's clear evidence of, of some of the negative health effects. There's also v even stronger evidence for the negative mental health effects of, of, of higher intensity and longer duration caregiving, including increase in depressive symptoms, uh, distress, uh, anxiety symptoms. And so that's a consistent finding. And then also the uh, economic impacts, which were, uh, I think, mentioned by, um, uh, during the presentation. Uh, this is Karen. I would just add that the um, data in support of the health impacts of family caregiving have uh, really increased in quality and scope in the last um, few years, maybe the last 10 years, so that we now have uh, well-designed population-based studies with comparison groups that help us to understand what the health impacts are and what proportion of the caregiving population um, experiences adverse health impacts. Not all family caregivers do. Um, uh, it's very clear that some, some family caregivers have a, a very uh, positive response to caregiving and, and do not experience a clear health impact. So we have to remember that the, the serious health impacts are not every caregiver but it's a substantial enough proportion of the caregiving population that we, um, that we think it is a public health concern. Another important consideration is, is that along with the, the uh, studies that have shown the health impacts is increasing, um, increasingly robust data on what the risks are that would help us to identify caregivers who are most likely to experience negative uh, health impacts. And that speaks again to the importance of assessment so that we can do a risk assessment to see um, which caregivers may need more assistance than they're currently getting. This is uh, Ladson. I just wanted to add that um, the report does uh, actually put a number on the um, on family caregivers who are uh, at this increased risk in terms of doing more uh, demanding and intense care. And that's um, the slide that's actually in Chapter 2, which is that 8.5 million caregivers provide help to 4.9 million uh, higher-need uh, older adults. We have a question about uh, risk assessment of, uh, or assessment of caregivers. Um, someone has asked what specific focus areas you have identified for conducting risk, needs, and preference analysis of family caregivers, and how should a community go about conducting this kind of assessment? Um, Jennifer? <laughs> All of sure. you address it. Yeah. So it's a great question, and I think something that um, a question that's most likely increasingly being asked, um, given some of the changes in delivery and payment reform, which are focusing on you know population health and um, rec you know which have sort of elevated an appreciation of the importance of family caregiving for um, individuals with some of the most complex health needs, um, as well as moving towards pragmatic strategies to really improve care, recognizing that family caregivers are often you know, pivotal in, in providing care, and that um, it's important to recognize family caregivers not only because of the, uh, the activities that they do to help older adults and other, other people with complex health needs, but because family caregiving is a risk, can be a, can be a risk, as we've just discussed. Um, so this uh, this question, I think, speaks to what we found in terms of a little uh, being a disconnect between some of the very rigorously rigorously conducted randomized controlled trials of caregiving interventions, which have typically been done in the community or in convenience samples that are disconnected from care delivery or um, sort of population health type initiatives. Um, with that said, I think that um, there's a recognition with the growing focus on um, you know, population health and electronic data capture systems and the diffusion of electronic health records, that there are, that, you know, there are potentially promising strategies for beginning to collect the information that would allow for more of a population health focused 
and screening um, to identify whether someone is a caregiver as well as their experiences. So this, is, this question really speaks directly to some of the recommendations, um, sub-recommendations in recommendation one that relates to trying to um, begin to distill some of the uh, learning from well-conducted randomized controlled trials and taking that information and those learnings and beginning to implement them in care delivery. So some of the base, you know, first steps would be beginning to systematically include fields, structured fields in electronic health records to identify whether someone has, you know, a substantial caregiving role so that um, health professionals who are caring for that individual are able to ask about that and potentially, um, you know, collect information that would allow them to make a referral when appropriate. Um, uh, also, uh, beginning to collect information in the electronic health record for individuals with health and functioning needs who rely on a caregiver to enact a care plan um, would, uh, if, we, if structured fields were available, to begin to identify who that person is, what functions they perform, and to be able to monitor that that person has been provided education and training, as well as screening um, uh, questions to determine whether or not a more comprehensive risk assessment should be undertaken would be sort of ne logical next steps and where, you know, formative foundational work really needs to be undertaken. This is Karen. I would add that while Jennifer was speaking, I was just checking in the report to see where we specifically address that. And I would say that in Chapter 5, um, uh, there's a box that shows the domains of caregiver assessment that were identified by the Family Caregiver Alliance um, several years ago. So that would, uh, would be a great uh, resource for participants on this uh, webinar. And also in that same section of Chapter 5, there's um, a discussion of the risk appraisal measure that was developed from a large NIH-funded study called REACH um, that um, did a, a lot of research on what particular risk factors uh, were most predictive of uh, caregivers who would benefit from extra intervention that could improve both their outcomes and those of the care recipient. This is Jennifer, and just to add um, that uh, while Karen was speaking, um, that Family Caregiver Alliance, which um, conducted a consensus conference around family caregiver assessment and, and um, where the results are summarized in Chapter 5, also has um, uh, compiled an inventory of assessments for family caregivers that's available on their website, which also may be a good place to start. Well, thank you for all the terrific questions, um, and thank you especially to our speakers um, and for everybody who participated today. There's tremendous interest uh, in getting the slides, as I mentioned before. So we've decided that we can, uh, and we have the ability to email each participant um, the PowerPoints for today's presentation. Um, and they will also be on the website that I mentioned earlier, nationalacademies.org slash caregiving. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon.